Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we are doing our May Lunch and Learn for 2023. And today our speaker is Jason Schaff, who is a beekeeper and owner of the Mill Creek Apiary, which is located in Medford, New Jersey. So he's going to do a tour of the hives that he has on his property um, and an inside look into beekeeping and all the bees that he has. So this is really exciting. And Jason and um, everyone that's there, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Well, thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, I'm honored to have a chance to uh, present this to your group. Um, so as you said, we, uh, my name is Jason Schaff. I'm the owner of Mill Creek Apiary. Uh, we're located in, in Medford, New Jersey, and uh, we own and operate um, several hundred colonies in South Jersey, uh, from Medford to Princeton, Jobstown. That's kind of our, uh, the extent of our geography. So it's all South Jersey. Uh, we primarily are honey producers, um, but we also sell bees, especially this time of the year, people are uh, looking to get started in beekeeping or or add to their apiaries. So we um, we raise our own queens and, and uh, sell nucleus colonies, which are very small versions of this. Um, we provide pollination services to, to local farmers. So we do blueberry pollination as well as cranberry pollination. Uh, we move our, our bees to different areas uh, at different times of the year to pick up different nectar flows to get different types of honey. Uh, what else do we do? I got Val here behind the camera, so I may be referring to her and Daniel's over here helping out. But um, we do workshops out here in the apiary, so similar to today. I mean, we have the, the benefit of doing it on Zoom, which is awesome. But uh, in the spring and summer, we'll have folks come out to the apiary. Everyone gets suited up. We do a hive inspection and do a honey tasting. And um, it's a great, you know, it's a great outing on a Saturday afternoon. So um, what else? And we also have some corporate partnerships. Um, so with Atlantic City Electric and Delmarva Power, we uh, put hives out on their campuses uh, to, you know, to, for employee engagement and to help them meet their environmental initiatives. So that's been a great experience. We do the same type of thing with these hive dives, both virtually and, and in person with those organizations, um, just to bring awareness to, to honeybees and pollinators uh, in general. And it tends to get people a little more focused in on, on the, you know, what we, what we do in farming and where our food supply comes from and kind of get down to the, the origin of, uh, of life. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to be going through one of these uh, colonies. We've got, I don't know if Val, if you want to give a little, so we're out on Jennings Farm, which is in Medford. This is one of our apiaries. We have about 15 apiaries uh, that we have pretty much set up the same way, you know, 20 to 30 colonies in each, and we get a variety of wildflower honey. That's primarily what we um, produce is wildflower honey. Um, so we will bring a portion of these bees this time of the year out to, so, so we have a bunch of colonies right now out on the blueberry crops nearby. Uh, so we provide a service to those farmers to pollinate their crops. So, you know, uh, many of you may know this, but, but it's moving, you know, pollination process is moving the pollen from one flower to another. So that's what the bees, they, you know, not just honeybees, but, but many other bees that are out there, they're moving the pollen grains from one flower to another, allowing that flower to produce a fruit. Through that process of pollination, the bees are collecting nectar and bringing that back to the hive. So the majority of the nectar coming into the hive when we're doing blueberry pollination is blueberry nectar. Same with the cranberry pollination is gonna be cranberry nectar. Uh, and we can get those honeys tested for those pollens to make sure that that is primarily what's in, in that honey. So if you see a varietal of honey in the store, cranberry honey, by law, it's gotta contain at least 50% that 
varietal of pollen. Wildflower honey is everything in the in the bees range. Uh, it's anything they can get to from the clovers to locusts to the knotweed to all these different uh, flowers that make the honey taste very different if we can isolate it. Um, but it also adds a lot of you know variability to what we produce throughout the, the spring and summer just because of the, the, the variation in what's blooming at different times of the year. That makes it interesting and fun and uh, and we have uh, we give folks the ability to taste all those different honeys at our shop. We've got a little shop in Medford, a little honey shop where you can come in and taste all we have to offer. And uh, that's been, that's been fun. So, so why, uh, why honeybees? Why are we talking about honeybees? Honeybees, um, they are crucial to farming. That's primarily what honeybees are about in, in this country. They're awesome for pollination in general, uh, adding biodiversity to our environment. And, and um, but primarily they're used in farming because we can move this, this colony from here to a crop or across the country. And the bees uh, will, will reorient to this particular location and, the, and to the pheromone of their queen and they'll always return to this box. So if we move them to another location, they'll, they'll come out of the hive for the first time in the morning, they'll reorient and they'll, they'll know to come back here, come back home here. So the fact that honeybees are so, um, they're so uh, mobile makes them so important to farming. There's no other insect that you can do that with. They're experimenting and they're using bumblebees a little bit in farming for the same purposes. But uh, you, you can't get the volume of bees. So in this box, in the middle of the summer, there'll be, you know, say 50,000, 60,000 bees. That's a lot of pollen. Now, they're all not going out and pollinating, but a portion of them, a portion of them are. Um, so that's a huge load of pollination that's happening from one colony of bees versus bumblebees. And there are other insects and bees pollinating the crops at the same time the honeybees are, but it floods those crops with with an insect that's um, gonna increase the farmer's yield of, of fruit, which is what they rely on. Because they, if they relied on just wind pollination or, or other insect pollination, they wouldn't get nearly the amount of, of fruit that they require to, to make a living. Um, so farming is primarily, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about colony collapse disorder and save the bees. And it's a great uh, conversation to have. It's a good conversation starter. And the honeybees are, are good at starting that conversation. But I mean, all of our bees are so crucial. There are about 4,000 honeybee species in the, in the U.S. alone. About 75% of them are solitary bees, not social as, as the honeybees are. Uh, but there are so many bees that we need to pay attention to. There are, I'd say, about 15 to 20% that are in serious decline right now. And um, that's largely in part to uh, just development, taking away the forests and the fields that where the bees find their their flowers. Um, it's it's in, uh, uh, yeah pesticide use and and just chemical chemical use by homeowners, not farmers. Homeowners are the biggest culprit of uh, of pesticide and herbicide use in the country. Um, we think of the farmers that are spraying their crops, that's a very small percentage of, of what's, what could be affecting the bees. So it's kind of up to us to pay attention to what we're using in our yards and we're spraying on the weeds and there's always alternatives. Um, so giving, you know, what we can do is, is to help the bees, uh, you know, plant more flowers, use less insecticides and just have an awareness of, uh, of the fact that they're in decline and need and need some some help. Um, it says ground bee season now. Yeah. So Daniel said ground. You're going to see this time of the year, especially in sandy areas, ground bees or solitary bees. Sometimes you go out in someone's yard and they're just loaded with these bees, and people are totally freaked out by them. But they're super gentle, very unlikely to sting. You can almost mow over top of them, and they're not going to bug you. But you may see a bunch of bunch of ground bees out there. The other thing I didn't mention is we a service we provide is to is uh, 
called pest control, but we, one, one thing is collecting swarms. So if you see swarms of bees on you hanging from a tree limb or a fence post, we'll come out and collect those bees, uh, usually at no cost, just as a community service. Uh, and then we introduce those into our apiaries and it's, it, it's, it's a good source of bees for us. Um, but also this time of the year, people are noticing that they have bees living in their house. So we'll go into the home, cut the, you know, cut the bee, open up the sheetrock, cut the bees out, remove the nest, clean the, clean everything up. And um, that's called a cutout. And we bring the bees out to the apiary here and try to nurse them back to health as best we can, which means checking for disease and mites and uh, viruses, feeding them if necessary, kind of nursing them back to, to a healthy state where they can thrive out here. So kind of the whole point of us as beekeepers getting involved in, in the pest control arena is to uh, help save the bee, help save the honeybees. Uh, right, that's a good point. So that myth busting about. Yeah, because people are scared of swarms. Right. Yeah, so the swarms, so this time of the year in the spring, if a, if a colony survives the winter, which is really our one of our main um, goals is to have our, all these colonies keep them healthy enough through the year that they survive the winter. Because when they come out of winter into the spring, they're very strong and they want to swarm, which means reproduce. So they cat, what they do in the spring is cat, they raise new queens and they'll cast off ha about half the colony with their old queen. And they, they leave and leaving behind half the colony with a new queen that's going to emerge and go on a mating flight and hopefully become a viable queen that's gonna continue on and lay eggs back at home. But the swarm, when it swarms off, they land in a nearby tree. And that's what we see. It's that big ball of bees hanging that's en route to a permanent location. So they're from that ball of bees, they're sending out hundreds or thousands of scout bees to look at different locations. Uh, once they find that perfect location, they have to get buy-in from all their nest mates. And it's a consensus that occurs. Um, once they get that consensus, they all leave immediately and go to the new, new spot. So those swarms of bees that we see are super gentle. I mean, they're, it's the most gentle that they're ever going to be in their, in their life. You can literally stick your hand up into this ball of bees and they won't, won't sting it's pretty amazing it's actually pretty amazing because it's so warm uh, inside the cluster um so super gentle and in general honeybees did i answer that yeah sort of okay um honeybees are are really cool insects like they're they're gentle uh super industrious they make these amazing foods for us humans you know not not their choice, but the, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they're easy to work. Um, if you see a honeybee in the wild or at, at home, they, they don't, they're not interested in humans. They're not interested in animals. They want to find flowers to either get the nectar or the pollen from. So even if you see them out at a picnic, just they're, they're not aggressive at all. It's the, it's the yellow jackets and the other insects that, that give honeybees a bad reputation. Uh, so there is a very big difference between the, the yellow stripey insects, um, and it's worth, worth knowing. Not, not, well, the honeybees are, Daniel's asking how, how you can tell the difference. Honeybees are a little, uh, the yellow isn't, isn't like a, a, a lemon yellow. It's more of a muted yellow and they're, they've got, they're a little furry. They've got a, um. Uh, I mean, if you look at the, the wing structure, the wing structure is a little bit different, but not, not many people are going to be noticing that. But it's really that the coloring is a little bit more muted and that furriness and they're cuter than a, than a yellow jacket. Come on, let's be honest. Um, yeah, okay, let's do it. Um, that was going to be reminding me on time because I can, can kind of ramble on. Real quick, this one, okay. How are we doing? It has been about 15. Okay. In, so the honeybee, I, Talk about what they produce. Obviously, honey, pollen, propolis, beeswax, and um, royal jelly. We they do produce. We don't get a whole bunch into that. Uh, you got me off. Sorry. Honey, pollen, propolis, beeswax. Oh, and bee venom. 
So bee venom, getting stung by a honeybee is really healthy if you're not allergic. Uh, bee venom therapy, BVT is used in homeopathic medicine. They harvest the, the bee venom in the hive. They you know put it into a syringe and they can inject it. Um, or you can just give yourself bee venom therapy. There are beekeepers that, that offer bee venom therapy just by stinging people with bees. It helps with Lyme disease, uh, MS. These diseases of inflammation benefit greatly from this bee venom therapy. So it's a very powerful medicine. Also honey, the, the other ones that I mentioned are super healthy. Honey's got vitamins, minerals, enzymes. Uh, it's, a, it's a sugar that many diabetics can tolerate because it's simple sugars, glucose and fructose. It's not a, not a complex sugar as sucrose is. Much easier for our body to um, uh, digest it and process it. Pollen is very high in protein. It's, it's, pollen is actually a, a whole food. So, so humans can exist on pollen alone if we had to, and if you had a lot of pollen, but very high in protein, amino acids, fats, um, vitamins, minerals, really, really healthy. It's a, it's, a, it's a plant source of B vitamins, one of the few. And um, so awesome products of the hive. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just gonna go through real quick and uh, explain what we've got here. I'm gonna put my veil on and then we'll, we'll open it up. So there's one bigger box down here at the bottom. That's called our brood chamber. This is where all the bees, this is where all the action happens. This is where the bees are raised, this is where the queen stays. There's a queen excluder right here, which is a metal device that we'll see when we get in there. Uh, that keeps the queen, the, the, the bees can get through that, but the queen cannot. She's just a little bit bigger and she can't fit through the queen excluder. So she stays in the brood chamber She'll lay all, all of her eggs down here, and that's where all the brood, which are the developing bees, that's where all the brood is is uh, is kept. Or you know, none of the brood gets up here because these are the honey supers. So they do all of their uh, development down here and do all of their storage up here, and that makes it easier for us. Now, this is all to make beekeeping easier for us beekeepers. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you could just give them a couple boxes, let them raise the the brood wherever they want, store the honey wherever they want. This makes it easier and cleaner for us to um, to harvest the honey. So once they start storing the honey up here, this time of the year when we go in there right now, you're going to see uh, a lot of it is what's called uncapped honey. When the bees bring the nectar in from the blossoms, it's 80, 80 odd percent. Uh, moisture inside the hive, they 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 uh, pull the wick the moisture out of it by moving it around the hive, and they get it down to about fifteen to eighteen percent moisture. So there's a lot of moisture in the hive that they have to expel. Once it's down to that low moisture content, they'll cap the cells with wax, and that doesn't allow any more moisture into the honey because if honey has too much moisture, it will ferment, and it won't last. So honey, honey never goes bad because of the fact that it's so low in moisture and it's pretty high in acidity. So those two reasons keeps honey good forever. Probably heard they, they recently found some honey in, in one of the Egyptian tombs and uh, it was still edible, pretty amazing. It will crystallize, crystallized honey is a normal natural process with honey and it's still delicious and perfectly healthy to eat. Uh, okay, so this is where the honey is stored. When we take these supers off, we take them back to our facility, harvest the honey, we spin the honey out of these, and then we uh, and we bring it back, put it back in, and they'll they'll refill it. So just working from the bottom, we have a bottom board here. This particular bottom board is a little bit more fancier of a bottom board. This is also a pollen trap. So we collect pollen using this at only certain times. So we'll put the pollen trap on the hive uh, for a few hours a day, maybe a couple times a week, because pollen is so crucial to the bees development, to the larval development that we don't want to starve them of pollen. We don't want to take too much pollen. Honey is a little bit easier for us to tell how much they have because of where it's stored. The pollen is harder to tell how much they have. So we just kind of limit how much pollen we, we, uh, collect and we collect the pollen for our own consumption. It's because it's so nutritious. Uh, and it's 
delicious. So uh, it's just another product that we that we offer. So we have our bottom board, our brood chamber, queen excluder, and our honey supers. And then we have our, our lid. And that's about it. And when we come out to the apiary, I come out with my hive tool, which allows me to kind of get, you know, crack things apart in there. And I come out with my smoker. And I've got just pine needles that I, that I use in my smoker. And that's about it. Super simple. We use the smoke. I'm actually gonna put a little more fuel in here. So we use the smoke to calm the bees. Uh, there's some conflicting, you know, reasons they believe that that works. Uh, either it's throwing off the pheromones. Jason, and, uh, um, yeah. Oh, I had a question about what. Um, yeah. What are you using to create the smoke? Like, what are you putting in there? Yes, yeah, so that's just pine needles. Oh, okay. Yep, pine needles. Very. Uh, you know, it's a plentiful source here in South yeah. Jersey, <laughs> and it smells good. It does. There's yeah. some other smoker fuels that uh, are pellets, and then some that are like cardboard. And uh, this is just not, what's that? Burlap is another one, and they smell nasty. Mm. And if we're out here all day, might as well smell something that smells like a campfire. So we use the so kind of you burn through them a little more quickly. They're not as long lasting but i'd much prefer to use this yeah, is any kind of smoke really used i mean so it sounds like you kind of can use anything or yeah you can kind of use anything you just want to be careful that there's not that one of the reasons i don't like cardboard is because there's the the glues in it that could be toxic. Oh, right. so you don't want to yeah. use anything that's toxic okay but yeah Great, pretty much anything but you just want to create a nice nice sort of cool smoke sometimes there can be depending on where the flame is in the canister it can be too hot and we're not blasting them. You'll see, we're just gonna give them a couple couple puffs, real light, sort of cool smoke. The uh, bees at the entrance, the guard bees, they sort of, they all communicate pretty quickly. They, uh, they start engorging themselves with honey because there is a belief with the, with the smoke that they have an instinctual response that there's fire. So they may have to evacuate the hive quickly. So you'll see them just sticking their heads where the nectar is and where the honey is and engorging themselves with honey with the belief that they're going to have to leave. So they want to be as full. So the honey is their carbohydrate source. Uh, that's what they're, yeah. The, the pollen is their protein source. And um, I'm getting off track in my head here. So the honey, so they're, they, Honeybees are, are hoarders. They're gonna bring in as much honey as they possibly can. And the more, the stronger of a colony they have, obviously the more honey they're gonna be able to bring in because it's their, their energy source through the winter. So honeybees overwinter in a cluster. Was that? Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, they overwinter in a cluster about the size of a soccer ball and they need to keep that cluster warm. So they vibrate their muscles through the winter, through the it's just the coldest parts of the winter. You go out, you're amazed that these bees can still be alive. Ah, there's no way, but they, but that cluster, they maintain about 95 degrees in the center of that, which is uh, incredible. So they just vibrate the muscles middle of the winter. So they use up that honey. They kind of move through the honey stores that are in the hive to give them that energy. But that's why they're bringing in honey throughout the year is to is for their winter food. I'm going to take a couple of these off because I know that these don't have much in them. These these top two, we just put them on recently. Um, this weather has been a little goofy for us with the between the cold and the rain. Um, it's just kind of throwing off the nectar flows. So whereas we would have seen more nectar in the hives right now, we're seeing a little less. Okay, so this is a honey super. There's no developing bees up here, but there are a lot of bees in here. So what these bees are doing is, uh, so when they come into the hive with the nectar, they transfer it to one of their nest mates. And then the nest mate brings it up and stores it in here. So we have in this box, we normally have 10 frames in the brood chamber. So these frames are real close to each other. 
in the honey soup, we separate them a little bit because it makes it, again, it makes it a little easier on us to harvest the honey. So when we, when we uncap the honey frame, having it a little bit wider here makes it easier for us to take off the capping, exposing the honey. So what you see here is how, pretty much how we would see it when we're, after we uncap it. Um, all the honey is exposed. Now, why we're seeing all the exposed honey right now is because it's early in the season. They're just bringing in, you know, nectar. They just haven't had a chance to get it dehydrated enough to, uh, to cap it over. We'll probably see some capped honey when we get down into the brood chamber, so I'll show you that. But this frame will go back to our facility. It goes into a centrifuge and all that honey gets uh, spun out of it. And then we're left with the same structure of all the honeycomb uh, that comes back out to the apiary and they refill it. But that because that structure, we wanna keep as much of that as we can because it's a very valuable uh, resource in the hive. It takes about eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So we wanna maintain as much of this wax as we can. Now, what we uncap, uh, you know, we'll use for our candles and for our skincare products, but we also wanna leave some of that structure there for the bees to uh, be able to utilize. So I don't, can you get, are you picking up like that glistening in there of the, of the nectar? Yeah. These guys are all just kind of cruising around, moving honey around, dehydrating it. They're going to fan their wings. They're going to. So again, with wildflower honey, we're going to get all different floral sources in this honey. Whereas if we went out to the blueberry fields right now, most of the nectar in this comb would be, you know, from the blueberry blossoms. I'm going to put that one back in. What do we have? No. And if anybody's got questions as we go, feel free to ask them. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat right now. Um, it's okay. just fascinating watching them, <laughs> watching it what is, you're doing. It is. And I mean, like I said before, the, the bees aren't gushing out of there attacking me. They're just going about their business, especially, you know, on a day like today where it's beautiful out, picked a good day by the way Caitlin uh, mm -hmm. oh good yeah I'm glad yeah. it worked out um, they're much less aggressive on a on a day like this if it was if it was a rainy day or, or impending weather uh, they usually get a little more a little more antsy but but not to the point where they'd be coming out unless we've had the hive open or we're doing something super invasive in in there they might get a little more aggravated but Super calm, docile insects. So I'm gonna just put this over here. Put that on, I mean, again, they're just hanging out in there. So we can put that off to the side as we're working in the brood chamber. I'm gonna put this on there just to make sure it doesn't blow off. So this is the queen excluder. It's precision made so that the bees, the, the space is just big enough for a bee to fit through, but not big enough for the queen. It's also not big enough for a drone. That's something we didn't talk about. There's three types of bees in here. Uh, there's a queen bee. Uh, most of the bees that are in here are worker bees, females. And then there's a percentage, about 20% are gonna be drones, which are the males. The males, so the, the females do all of the work in the hive, literally. They, they forage for the nectar and the pollen, they collect the water, they tend to the young, they do everything. The only purpose that drones have in the hive is to mate. So the drones will go out middle of the day, every day. You'll see sort of a, you really see it when they're coming back, there's an exodus of all the drones. They go to a drone congregation area, it's called DCA. And there are these areas up in the sky all over. Um, and they hang out up there and they wait for queens to come up and mate. 
So when the queen, when we raise our queens, um, once they emerge from their cell, we put them into a small version of this and we wait for her to emerge uh, and go out on her mating flight. And it's a, it's a dicey time because queens fly slower, they're more likely to get picked off by birds. And um, many times we won't achieve a mated queen. But uh, when, she, when she does come out for a mating flight, she'll go up to these drone congregation areas Fly, fly through and mate with as many drones, typically 10 to 15 drones. That gives her um, all the genetic diversity in her, she stores it in her spermatheca for her entire life. Uh, so the genetics from these 10 to 15 drones will be expressed in the, in the colony as she, as she lays eggs. Um, she can either lay a, 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 she can lay a fertilized egg or an unfertilized egg. The fertilized eggs are going to be the worker bees. The unfertilized eggs will be drones. So depending on how many drones the colony needs, she can. The colony will create the, the place for her to lay those drone eggs, unfertilized eggs. Um, so the colony as a whole has to kind of decide how much, how many drones they need, how much percentage of drones they need in this colony. Um, and then the queen will lay an egg in that, an unfertilized egg in that cell and it will become become a drone and then at the end of the season the drones get kicked out they you know we end up with a lot of dead drones in the front of the hive because they offer nothing to that colony in the winter and then come uh come springtime she'll lay more unfertilized eggs and they'll get their drone population back because drones are crucial to good queen mating all right so my hive tool just gives me you see some stickiness here this is propolis this is uh, something they collect. Well, that might not, that's wax. Um, this is propolis here, a little bit darker. That's a tree resin. And it's got a lot of real super healthy compounds in it that you'll see in like propolis tinctures and uh, other products, throat sprays and cold medicines, things like that. So that's, that's propolis. So I'll just pry this apart. Um, Give myself a little more space in here. A little bit of wiggle room with these frames, but these are all precision made frames. They were developed by Lorenzo Langstroth in Philly, actually. And uh, he, he designed this so that you could have removable frames, uh, which is actually a requirement of the state of New Jersey to have frames that are inspectable. And we just had our state apiarist come out last week and give us a clean bill of health, which was nice. Because we need we need that inspection for our uh, to be able to sell bees. Okay, so what we're looking at here, what's that? Yeah. It is. So so we look for like Daniel said here, brood. So this is brood. Cap brood is all developing bees in here. They Cat, so right there as a larvae, they're going to cap that over soon, and then the bee will pupate into what you know into more of a bee-looking creature under this capping. Um, and then when she's ready to emerge, she will chew her way out of that capping. So this brood, we can tell by by the flatness of it. It's a worker brood. Uh, drone brood will, will look different and I see one over here. No. So the outer frames, I'm gonna look for the queen as we go here. Uh, these outer frames typically, you know, they've got some, so that is, yeah, that's some drone brood. They see how, how raised that is. Kind of, the, the drones are so much bigger that they, they you can, and they're actually a wider cell. So that's where the drone, we'll see more drone as we go through. But this is our worker comb. I don't see our queen, but what I do see is queen cell. So this is there. I'm going to open this up here. And inside there's royal jelly. So that is a queen cell that, and there's a larvae in there too. So these guys are looking to swarm. Uh, they're either running out of space or 
uh, they just want to swarm. They just have that instinct to swarm. So when we go through, we inspect our hives pretty often, every you know, week to two weeks. When we see this, we take it out so that they don't have the opportunity to uh, develop that into a queen cell. Because if they develop it into a queen cell, they're going to swarm with the old queen. So half of our, half of our colony is going to leave us. And we're not going to produce a whole bunch of honey from this colony. And it sounds, sounds a little selfish right now. But that's business we're in is create is producing honey and we want to keep all the bees here. That's true. That Daniel says sometimes they don't survive after swarming. It's about 25% survival rate um, of a wild swarm. So if we can collect that swarm, it gives them a better chance of survival. All right, so we're seeing here honey stored around the outside. So around their brood, this is more worker brood in here. And there is a drone. So these are all workers. He's, yeah. The drones have much bigger eyes. Uh, they just got a W your body. And they don't have stingers. So you can it was fun to, to let the kids hold the drones and play with them because they're you know that they're not going to get hurt by them. So when we go into the colony, we're looking for eggs. Well, I mean, depending what we're what we're inspecting for, but in terms of making sure there's a viable queen, we don't have to find the queen. We just have to find eggs, let me give a tiny bit of smoke because we know that if we see eggs, then we've had a laying queen within the past three days because after three days, they'll cap that over. I'm sorry, it, after three days, they, it, they develop into a larvae. But if we see eggs, we know that She's been in here in the past three days. So these are queen cups. I'm checking these. Usually this time of the year, we're checking them all. So I open that up to see if there's an egg in there and there's not. And when I see an egg, we'll show you, but they are pretty, pretty tiny. Sometimes depending on the light, they're tough to see. So we, when we work the hive, we wanna, Look at with the sun kind of behind us. And you notice when I'm, when I'm putting these putting frames back in the same orientation that they came out, just less stress on the bees and it's an easy practice to maintain, to put things back kind of the way we found them. There's another queen cup. So I'm gonna just look. So what this, what you're seeing here is a frame that, it's a newer frame. And this is, it's called foundation. And it's embossed with the, a worker sized cell. And the bees then will draw that out with beeswax. And, and they'll draw it up. And then once they get it up deep enough, they can start storing honey or pollen that the queen can, can light. Sometimes we'll see it at about this stage and the queen's already putting eggs in there. Like she's looking for space to, to lay eggs because if she doesn't have space to lay eggs, especially this time of the year, they are going to swarm. That's what they, they're going to go find a place where they can build a bigger nest. All right. So right up in here, we're seeing a little bit of pollen. So when they bring, uh, let's see if I can find, so the bees, when they collect the pollen from the flowers, they, they, they store it in, pollen baskets on their back legs. They kind of stuff it in there and it allows them to fly back to the, the colony with these big loads of pollen on their back legs. When they get it into the colony, as they're coming back to the colony, they're adding a little bit of honey to it or nectar or sugar source and they're adding enzymes to it. And that's starting this fermentation process on their way back to the, the colony. So this 
pollen starts a fermentation process that breaks down the, the outer shell of the pollen grain and makes it more digestible uh, to, the, to the young larvae. And that's what they're bringing the pollen in primarily for is to feed the young larvae. And they put it, they pack the pollen into these. So this is pretty interesting. That's actually a, that red pollen is like a dead metal pollen. So we'll see different colors of pollen. Typically it's, you know, it's that yellow or kind of brownish. You guys know what? Well, the trap's not on. Daniel was saying we may not see as many, see as much pollen on the bees, but that, that pollen trap I was telling you about earlier is actually not, not installed. Uh, I can show you that. It goes on the back of the hive and slides in, but we don't have it on right now. Uh, quick question, Jason. Do the sure. um, do the drones have a shorter lifespan since they don't really, you said they mate and then um, aren't really of use to the hive anymore. So do they have a shorter lifespan than the other bees? Awesome. It's about the same as the worker bees. It's about six weeks. So, okay, these guys will all live six weeks, pretty short life. Mm. And the queen bee can live, you know, three to five years, which is oh, wow. pretty astounding. But the bees, which one of the cool things about honeybees is that they, um, sorry if I get, I'm, <laughs> they are given jobs based on their age, which is, you know, essentially their experience. Uh, so when they, when they first emerge, my point of that is that the, the last job that they have is to forage for nectar and uh, they actually get to fly out of the hives, the foraging, and they kind of work themselves to death with all that flying, they kind of their, their wings become tattered and, um, and they die off, but they're, so, Anybody see anything on that frame? That's our queen. So just real quick with the with the jobs, get that thought out. Um, they so they're they're divvied out jobs based on their age. So they'll they'll take care of of the young larvae. They'll clean the hive in the beginning. Um, they'll eventually get to the point where they're defending the hive. So they become uh, guard bees at the entrance. And then their last job is to forage. So they kind of make their way slowly out of the hive. But by, by, by getting divvied out uh, jobs based on experience, it's a much more efficient system in here. Hmm. So that's our queen bee. She's marked yellow based on okay. the year. So she was born last year. There's a five color system for marking our queens. Um, so because Blue, yellow, red, uh, green, white. No, so I'm I'm, I'm off. Um, it's white, yellow, <laughs> red, green, blue. So it's a five color cycle. And since queens typically don't live past five years it's enough of a it's enough colors so by looking at her we know that so to mark her we're just going to pick her up we have a paint pen and it gets marked on our thorax and it doesn't affect her it doesn't hurt her um but it allows us to know if we need to you know let's say we came into this colony and that brood pattern wasn't so solid she's not laying that well we could look at her and say oh she's She's a white dot queen, which is a couple years old. Maybe she's losing viability. Like her second year is usually her most prolific laying year. Yeah, that's Paul right there. That's good, good eye. Um, and then she's gonna taper off. Like she's gonna start just becoming less. And, and the colony will sense that too. And they can raise a new queen. They can take one of the eggs that she lays and start feeding it royal jelly. And that's what makes queen bees different than, than worker bees is that from the time they're at larvae and they're fed, they're only fed royal jelly. And she is only fed royal jelly to this day. Uh, and that's one of the reasons she's, she's fed. They, they take her excrement out of the hive. They, the only thing that that bee does is lay eggs. 
that is it. Not much of a ruler, right? She doesn't make any decisions in the hive. It's all decisions in the hive are made by consensus, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, and she's just kind of cruising around looking for spots to lay. Let's see if we can see her laying an egg here. Okay. Move up to it, and then she's going to back her, back her stuff. And she's got this cord of bees around her. And when they're really pointed in toward her, it means that she's got a really strong pheromone. Come on, girl. So, does that mean is that she's getting ready to lay eggs soon if she has strong pheromones, or just means she's she's more robust? She's going to have a greater following, like she's healthier, let's say. Mm, okay. Yeah. That's so cool. And she always has just this cord of bees around her, taking care of her. Come on, let's see you lay an egg. <laughs> she got stage fright. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try for the camera. Well, um, no other well, questions on our end here okay. for right now, but it is pretty, that was, that was really great yeah. to be able to see her. Yeah. I'm going to leave her off to the side there in case we want to go back and look at her. So we've got a ton of pollen here. How are we doing on time? Um, I think we're almost 45 minutes. We're about 40. Okay. So let me, I'm going to shake these guys. So we shake bees a lot and it looks violent, but it's very gentle. And it just allows us to get the bees off the frame if we need to look at something more carefully. So I shook them in and they're just going down to the bottom of the hive and not freaking out. So this just, you can see the variation in, in pollen colors. I don't know if you want to, it's easier to like. We have some super like dark brown black pollen all the way up to this. It's interesting. And the other thing about bees is that they're they have it's called floral fidelity, which means they're only going to visit one type of flower uh, on any given flight. So the pollen that we see um, coming back on the bees, like the pollen grains. Let me find that again, Daniel. So that. The, not the grains, the uh, the granules of, yeah, we got more queen cells there. I'm gonna cut out the pollen here, come on. Yeah, it's right here. See that pollen on our back legs? So that's all from one type of flower. Which is pretty interesting. And they do that because the different flowers have different nutritional elements. Oh, yeah, I get the queen cells out. And no eggs. So that's good. It looked like there was only that one uh, or two queen cells back there. I'm going to take a quick peek here. While we're in here, we just want to cut those cells out. That one looks fine. Again, see, against the, the wall of the hive is usually just stores of food. So there's some nectar, there's some pollen out here. They don't usually put brood out there. I think it was, is it this one? I thought there was another cell that I passed up before. No. Okay. So these guys, again, they're super gentle. We so when we raise our bees, we raise our own queen. So we take we choose colonies that we like. That, you know, qualities we like. It could, it could be gentleness, could be overwintering ability, could be honey production. So colonies, essentially queens that are 
producing those those qualities we graft from. So we take a frame like this that has eggs in it, uh, you, eggs and super young larvae, and we have a special tool. There she is. Let's say goodbye. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so we take, so we graft, we, we, we take a super young larvae, take it out of the cell and we put it in a special queen cup. And that's queen cup size, like those queen cups that we saw in here, that size indicates to the bees that they need to feed that cell royal jelly. So um, when we graft it, the bees feed it royal jelly and we raise these queens, you know, we raise, you know, a few hundred a year. Um, and they have the they have the qualities that we desire to an extent. Because once that queen bee emerges and she goes on her mating flight, then we have the genetics of all those the drones that she's mating with, which we really don't have any control. We have some control over it based on our own colonies that we have in the area that are producing drones and sending them out. So we have that control over it, but you know, there's a ton of feral bees and other beekeepers and things like that, that um, who, whose drones that our queens are mating with. So we only have a certain amount of control, but we call our queens mutts, but they just have good qualities or good, you know, it's hybrid vigor. And um, we've had great success with, with the bees that we sell to the public. That's our brood going back in. Does anybody have a question before? Because we don't like really like to be in here much more than about a half hour. Uh, so I'm going to close them back up. Any anything anybody wants to see or um, question about while I'm still in here? No. Uh, no, I don't okay. see anything in the chat. Okay. Yeah. I'll put these guys back in. Super. Thank you. <laughs> thank <Jenny>. you, bees. <laughs> yes, thank you, bees. So, um, you know, I've always heard, um, I guess, like myths about bees, whether I didn't know that drones didn't have a stinger, but is it only the workers and the queen or does the queen not sting either? She can, she can, but she can't. So the thing when, when the bee stings, like physically, they, they curl their body so that that stinger comes out at a certain angle mm -hmm. the queen the queen physically isn't able to do that uh, so she's not we're not worried about her stinging if they can't get their body into that the curled shape they're not going to expel the stinger like you can't keep a bee sort mm -hmm. of straight bodied and expect her to push the stinger into you mm -hmm. so the queen basically queen doesn't sting the workers are the only ones that sting drones you know don't don't even have stingers, right? And they and when they when the workers do sting, they die. They're not able to live because right? I've always heard that rumor. Yeah, yeah. Or... that's okay. yeah, that's right. So, so they have a barbed barbed stinger. Once it goes in, and it's got so it goes into your skin, stays in there. She pulls apart, pulls away from it, but mm -hmm. it leaves behind some muscles that continue to. Uh, pulsate and mm. pump the venom into its, you know, the victim. So when we do bee sting therapy, like I do bee sting therapy on myself. Um, like I, I've got some arthritis in my knees, and I'll mm. sting myself in my knees, and it gives me relief. A few weeks later, it takes a little bit for the so the bee sting. It causes inflammation, and then when that subsides, the pain of that arthritis really does go away for a little bit it's pretty amazing but um but when i sting myself i leave that stinger in my skin for about 15 minutes just to allow it to continue pumping the just to get as much out of that as i can oh okay sounds kind of gross but <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh i didn't realize that um, there were so many other health benefits um the propolis, the the bee venom. I kind of heard about the bee venom, but wasn't sure if it was a fad thing or not. Um, no, I mean, so there's some, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it's been used for 
thousands and th- you know back to ancient Egypt and ancient China. You know, it's these uh, products from honeybees have been used for for medicine. Mm-hmm. And it was in you know medical uh, these products were in the in the literature up until not you know pretty pretty recently in the past hundred years or so. Right. It's just been we've gotten away from it with modern medicine, but it's, it can, can heal heal a lot. Even honey uh, on externally on wounds, if you use it on a burn or or a cut abrasion. Um, that's true. Yeah, Val just said we have go to our website, which is yeah, shameless. <laughs> I was going to promote uh, your website either way. <laughs> okay, it's just it's MillCreekAbiary.com, but the, Val mentioned that there's a blog post on there about the the benefits of honey as a externally on your skin, but it um, it's used in hospitals for for some uh, wounds uh, sores that won't heal. Because the, you know the the modern medications won't aren't effective, but honey keeps a wound moist. It allows the wound to weep, um, the lymph, and it keeps it antibacterial. So all mm-hmm. these things are happening at the same time with something that's as simple as honey. And manuka honey is what's typically used. Uh, it's from New Zealand, and it just is. It's got a lot, a lot more of those antibacterial qualities. Than, than our honey does. But ours is, I mean, any honey is is great. I don't know what percentage more you're getting with the Manuka honey, but I can tell you it's about 500% as expensive as as a local honey. So I think you're, and it tastes like medicine. It doesn't taste great. Mm. Just go with local honey. Yeah. It's better for you. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, so yeah, I think, so that's, that's, that's about it. It's quick little, uh, tour here but appreciate you tuning in and and having an interest in in bees hopefully you learned a little something and maybe have a, a different viewpoint of of uh honeybees and all bees and all insects for that matter when you see them because they're so vital to our environment and to our health that we need to uh need to pay attention yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah. And thank you, Jason, and the team there for showing us the apiary and all about bees. Um, I'll uh, I put the um, link to your website in the chat, but again, it's MillCreekApiary.com if you want to check out right. their. Uh, you guys have products and you have workshops that you can attend through there, right? right? Okay. Right. Great. Exactly. Products, workshops. You can we ship all over the country if you if you want something shipped. And uh, come and visit us if you're in Medford. Stop by the awesome. shop. Awesome. Open Thursday to Sunday, and uh, love to see you there. What's that? Excellent. Come and see Val. She's behind the camera, but you can meet her in person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us, and uh, have a great day. Enjoy this weather. Yep. You too, Jason. Thank you okay. so much. Take care. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.